You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a lender and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for December 21st, 2018. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we never shut down and our slats are always steely. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Hi, Drift Glass. Hey, Blue Gal. Take two. We've got an a old sponsor, right, this week? Yeah. Uh, an old family friend, you might say, an old buddy. Uh, where the good Lord split you emergency farewell party supplies, where the offer code this week is Jim Mattis sends his regards. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, so it's, before we realized that we weren't recording um, our podcast and we had to turn on the record button <laughs> yeah. a few minutes ago. <laughs> it's not automatic. You got to push this button right here. It's not fair. <laughs> we yeah. uh, were talking about airplanes. We were. And uh, Drift Glass, poor Drift Glass sometimes has to ride. Uh, commercial aircraft and always I do. wants to get into an exit row, right? Yes, I do. I do because I'm freakishly tall. Yes. Mm-hmm. We were talking about that in context of Syria mm-hmm. and how when I get seated in the exit row, I am always asked uh, by the nice people on the aircraft, do you have any problem opening the door and helping other passengers out? Mm-hmm. And I say, of course not. I can handle that. I'm an executive. I can do shit like that. I got this down. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And uh, luckily, I've never been in a situation where that was necessary. But there is a difference in an aircraft that is going down. Because I think we can all agree, there's no place for the U.S. in Syria. There's no end game there. There's no reason we're going to – there's no reason for us to be there. There's no, there's no end game strategy where we control Damascus. That's just not going to ever fucking happen. And that, and that is what Chris Murphy said on Rachel Maddow last yeah. night. If you get a chance to go hear that, uh, those of us who would like less war, yeah. but don't necessarily want a so-called president to be farting out decisions like pulling out of a country or changing, making a massive turn in military strategy on the toilet and yeah. not consulting our allies and not consulting his own military experts. We need some wisdom there. And that doesn't mean we want to stay in Syria. So people who try to trap you into a false binary of, mm-hmm. oh, either you're either for getting out of everywhere right now, uh, drop just drop your weapons and walk to the, to the borders and that's it, we're done. Or you must love war, you neoliberal asshole. You want, to, right. you want the America to... to have their boot on everyone's throat for the next thousand years. There's no middle ground between these two positions. Pick one. Well, that person is not arguing in good faith. They're, they're arguing in bad faith for bad motives. The truth is I can help people out of an aircraft in case of an emergency landing. And I would do it in an orderly fashion. The door would open. We'd all go down the slide. It'd be fine. There is a huge difference between exiting an aircraft that way and exiting an aircraft in the, in the William Shatner thing on the wing way of blowing the fucking window out at 20,000 feet. Right. Both of them will, in fact, get people off the aircraft, but one of them is incredibly dangerous and dumb and precipitous and an awesome episode, by the way. And the other one is how you are supposed to do it. So all I'm suggesting is let's not do it the Goldfinger method or the <laughs> William Shatner method or, frankly, the, uh, the uh, Iron Man movie method of blowing out the side of the aircraft and just people shoveling people into, into midair overnight. And I don't want to do anything, frankly, anything that comes with Vladimir Putin's seal of approval without hearing a whole lot more discussion from a whole lot more people who aren't currently being manipulated by Vladimir Putin like a predator drone. Who, right. uh, let's and face I'm it, Putin. Oh, yes. I, well, I just wanted to carry your analogy to another level, which is I was actually on an aircraft at one time where uh, three very happy women got on the plane and they were intoxicated. They were having a real good time. They were partying. And I don't know if they were part of a wedding party or what, but they had been drinking. And uh, they walked to their seats and they were seated in an exit row. And one of them yelled out, oh, God, we're in an exit row. Everybody's going to (laughs) die. And (laughs) needless to say, Hmm. the flight attendants landed on them very quickly and reseated them in a very quiet and professional manner. 
so that they would not be responsible for the safety of anyone when it came to some sort of unplanned event, right? Mm -hmm. And here is Donald Trump. Again, as I say, he's just farting out stuff on Twitter to make it uh, distract, to distract from Flynn, to distract from the wall, to, to make drama. And there is no one behaving as the flight attendant with him. No one in no. the White House, no. no one in the Congress, no one in the media really is saying, I mean, the, the uh, Washington Post and New York Times editorial boards, they aren't calling for Trump's resignation, not as of yet. No. Who is the flight attendant who's going to say, no, you're too drunk to be responsible on power or, you know, <laughs> what did you, what do we call him again? We call him Adderall Stevenson. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's Adderall or I don't know, Alzheimer's or whatever it is, or just ego or just being Donald Trump, whatever it is that's making you this crazy. You can't be in this seat. You can't. No. Well, there used to be a, a, uh, an organized uh, body in this country called the Congress. Oh yeah, I heard. And I believe I, yeah, I believe they were. I, I haven't seen them in these parts for many many years, but they went home, I believe literally. yeah they went home. Yeah. Um, and just as a brief aside, if you're on an aircraft and there are three three women sitting in the exit row, and one of them is spinning thread, and one is one of them is measuring thread, and one of them is cutting thread, mm -hmm. and they're talking about the plane crashing, get off the plane immediately. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Those you can look that up. Fates, right? Those are the three fates. Those are the three fates. <laughs> um, I, there used to be, again, an entity called Congress. I, and now that Nancy Pelosi is pretty clearly going to be the hammer that uh, brings him low, uh, I guess the pilots are coming on board in a couple of weeks. Although I got to say, um, for my money, uh, as deeply conflicted as people are, and rightly so, about Tim Ryan, um, he did a public service this week. Uh, Congressman Tim Ryan stood up and talked about Republicans having amnesia. Yes. Oh, so wonderful. And uh, so there are people, and this is, uh, you and I talked about this during uh, version 1.0 of this show. Yeah. Um, um, let me read the transcript here. Sure. I, I transcribed this this morning. The, ev not everyone out there is a fan of Tim Ryan. I understand no. that. He is a thorn in Nancy Pelosi's side from time to time. He has an inconsistent record on abortion. And uh, but this morning, he this morning. a healthy dose of truth to the mm -hmm. Congress. And uh, he said, this has been a really interesting debate because our friends on the other side, it's like they have amnesia and nothing happened before the election a couple of years ago. And you and I da, are da, da, da. <laughs> clapping at my laptop. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 And he reminded people about who's going to pay for the wall in Mexico. He reminded people that Republicans are just full of uh, nonsense about, oh, the Democrat Party and their hollow words, when actually they're asking the American taxpayer to pay for the border wall. Mm -hmm. uh, the president, so-called, is going back on the promises he made. He's the one who went to all these swing states and said Mexico is going to pay for it. By the way, he also promised a 10% tax cut for middle class people. He did. During many, the many, many times. Yep. <laughs> and said that Congress was working on it. Steve Mnuchin will not say whether that's a real thing or not. He said, We're working on other things, says Steve Mnuchin. I figure it's, yeah. you know, our resignation later, letter and staying out of jail. Those are the things they're working on. Tim Ryan finished with, and this is, this is again, something we've said many times. You guys, and he's speaking directly to Republicans on the House floor, you guys are living in the past. This government is in chaos. It's in free fall. The market's in free fall. The staffing at the White House is in free fall. The Secretary of Defense is gone. We're pulling out of Syria. What is going on? You are in charge of the House, Senate, and White House. Get a grip and learn how to govern the country. And this is when you said to my laptop, yeah, but Republicans hate governing. <laughs> they right. hate government. They hate government. This is how this is what happens when you hate government. There, there's no flight attendants. There's no security measures. The plane is not checked out. There's no pilot. Uh, we're just going to let the markets and whims and whatever happens. This is what Grover Norquist said they wanted. Yeah, right. Just a hand. We just need a hand to sign shit that we put in front of it. Well, that's literally what they got. They got an, an empty suit, a giant 
smelly, racist lunatic who will sign anything they put in front of him because he has no idea what the fuck they're doing. This is exactly the government that that these people have been working for for 30 years. And that's what drove me crazy in the last couple of days. Uh, because over the last 48 hours, uh, President Limbaugh has ordered Donald Trump to uh, put, a, put some brakes on funding the government. Because President Limbaugh does not like the way this shit's going down. So he ordered his minion, his lackey, his lick spittle, his ass kisser, Donald Trump, to just put a stop to this shit right now. And he got Ann Coulter and Sean Hannity, the, who are basically the cabinet, to order Donald Trump to stop doing what he was doing. And Donald Trump, being a coward, did. Well, this is the problem. I turn on television, which was my first mistake. Turning on Meet the Press Daily is a mistake, Griffith. And I, who do I see being brought onto a camera to talk about how how horrifying it is that a talk radio asshole has this much influence over America? But Charlie Sykes. Yeah, he wasn't he a talk radio asshole? Yes, talk radio asshole of, of many, many, many years experience. Then five minutes ago, the wind shifted. He became a never Trumper, and we and everyone on television and all of his colleagues at MSNBC have all agreed not to mention the fact that. For most of his adult life, he was the guy who created the problem that is now killing us. So we're going to let Charlie Sykes off the hook. And he's just wringing his hands and shaking his head about Rush Limbaugh. Okay, come back a couple hours later. There's Chuck Todd talking to Hugh Hewitt, another right-wing radio asshole who made his entire professional life creating the mindless, reprogrammable zombie Republican base that will destroy America. About Is it weird how much influence talk radio hosts have over conservatives? And the problem, and, and I believe this morning it was um, it was uh, John Podhoritz on one side and Bill Crystal on the other uh, on the Morning Joe show. And I just I look at that that spectrum on te- this is cable television. This is how people get their news. This is how the the agenda, the public square agenda, is set every given on any given day. There's no voice in there from liberals to say to point at Charlie Sykes to say, but he's the fucking problem. Five minutes ago, he was fucking Rush Limbaugh. Why aren't you saying that? And and that's a measure of how terrified these people are of us. Yeah, but Drift Glass, speaking of terrified, and, and I think they're all doing that because there are suits upstairs at MSNBC. Oh, sure, ratings, yeah. yeah. And they love their tax cuts, and they want uh, voices that make Wall Street happy. Yes, they do. But uh, ratings are down at Fox, Drift Glass. They're, mm-hmm. they're losing to Rachel Maddow every night. Mm-hmm. And I think they're, I don't know how you feel about this. I, I feel like some Fox viewers actually change the channel when shit's going yeah. down. Yeah. I, I, they have to. Yeah. They have to. You earlier used yeah. the analogy of the doctor who has bad yeah, news, Well, I used right? an analogy of a prostitute, actually. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> you know, you can you can go to the, your local knocking shop and hire some young lady or young gentleman to put on a uniform, pretend to be your physician, or pretend to be a nurse, to work out your fantasies, and that's just fine. But if you feel something weird going on in your chest or your throat or your head, you're not going to go to that person and ask them to diagnose what's wrong with you. And that's what goes on in Fox. Fox is a whorehouse. Fox is where people dress up look to look like news people to tell idiots the lies they want right. to hear. That is the Fox business model. But when it comes to shit actually landing in your backyard, Things that might affect you personally. Right. Or, or even something that wouldn't necessarily affect you personally, but might affect your politics, like the Flynn sentencing, right? Right. right. And we're going to get into that. But if you really want to know what happened in court today, you're not going to want, you're yeah. going to switch to Rachel Maddow and find out. Yes. And it, it is like, you know, oh, I feel this lump yes. in my body and it might be something bad. I really need to go in here if it's that bad. I need to know, right? What do you think, Marina Bartiromo? Oh, it's just the swelling of your love. You know, <laughs> Lord Ingram, it's the swelling of your of your love of Donald Trump in your heart. That, no, no, it's not. It's a large heart. It's a bad thing. <laughs> and and but that's they're they're so uh, addicted to staying inside the bubble. They're they're so terrified of leaving it. And, and but there really is a parallel going on on MSNBC, which is the, you know, basically the competition, well, which is Well, I just is, wanted to talk about Brian Kilmeade for a minute if you don't Oh, yeah, mind. yeah, no, no. That's this a morning, very good point. This morning and yesterday Kilmeade just lost it on Donald Trump. And uh, you know, this is supposed to be Fox and Friends is supposed to be the safe space for right. Donald Trump and his White House. Period. And uh Yesterday, Kilmeade directly 
criticize Trump by name for uh, his actions in Syria. And today he had on Sarah Sanders, who's supposed to, you know, be able to go there and, and lob those softballs at her all day long. She's just going to tell you what the what the president's really str- strengths are and, and so forth. And Kilmeade said he is giving Russia a big win. Vladimir Putin praised him. And this is where mm-hmm. he really, Kilmeade really crossed the line here. He's also doing exactly what he criticized President Obama for doing. He said oh, President no. Obama was the founder of ISIS. He just refounded ISIS because they have 30,000 men there and they are already striking back with our would-be evacuation. The president, I love this line, the president is really on the griddle with this. <laughs> you thought Maisie Hirono was in trouble for saying bullshit on the air. There's No, you cannot say... It's as bad as Obama as bad on Fox as, News. Trump is being as bad as Obama. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, he just went off on it. Um, this reminds me of that rare uh, heretofore unseen episode, uh, one lost episode of, of Lassie, the one where Lassie attacks Timmy <laughs> and tears his throat out and corners the family in a barn and sets the barn on fire and then barks and runs away uh, well, because I, it was I too dark. Someone is sort of paying attention to moments like this and documenting them in a way that we sort of figure out where Rupert Murdoch's sons are in all of this yeah. and noticing when ratings drop and when we're, we're number six and number seven, when Rachel and Lawrence O'Donnell are one and two or one and three. And in the middle is some treasure hunt show. <laughs> you know, This is right. real ratings. This is like not just among all cable news stations running an hour that night. This is the ratings for all television. And Rachel Maddow is number one that night. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think something's going on at Fox where the wheels are off there, too, with some people. Um, and well, they're, this, they're given permission to do it because it's scripted television still. This happened, uh, for those of us with a long memory, it didn't happen overnight. It never happens overnight. It never even happens in a way that anyone admits anything. There's always a trial balloon and a second trial balloon and a third. Um, But this is what happened towards the end of the Bush administration when it became no longer possible to pretend that everything wasn't on fire and horrible. And that's when everyone became not interested in politics anymore. Right. You started listening to music. (laughs) Yeah. We don't want to hear about it no more. And really, you could just sense on on the right this desperate desire to get out from under this incredible fuck up that they had created without ever taking any of the fucking blame. And that's where we're at now. Yeah. This is why MSNBC is 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 packing the place with John Podhoritz and Bill Crystal and Charlie Sykes and Hugh Hewitt. Uh, and, and nary a contrarian voice is heard. The, the, you, you'll hear contrarian voices talk about Donald Trump. It's, it's safe to talk about what a horrible, awful, terrible uh, Democrat, really, he's a Democrat, Donald Trump is. It's perfectly safe to talk about that as long as we never, ever talk about what happened two minutes before Donald Trump came down the escalator, because that's where everything falls apart. And that's why the entire media is fucked, because we've now seen this is something that you and I talked about and predicted rather depressingly. The spectrum of acceptable conversation in this country about politics has now shifted, I don't think irrevocably, but pretty firmly into on the right (laughs) is Fox News. On the left is Bill Crystal and John Podhoritz and Joe Scarborough. And they're not going to let any liberals into that bubble to bang around in there like a piece of shrapnel knocking things down. They're just never going to allow that to happen. So what the, the way we succeed is by being on the outside, pounding on the shell, yelling our heads off until there's no way to ignore the fact that, yeah, Liberals were right all along. Yes, the left has been right all along. And that's a phrase that they're just never going to utter unless they have a crowbar stuck up their ass and they're forced to do it by circumstances. And we constitute the circumstances that make that happen. We and a lot of other people. And I do think that that the voices on social media that are saying every time Chuck Todd says both sides, Twitter explodes at him now. Twitter does explode at him. It's remarkable. And, And he has acknowledged on the air, oh, you know... I know, I know. Don't say both siderism to me on Twitter. I'm going to say it in this case. It's true, you know, and, and giving and giving himself a little buffer there. 
that really doesn't work. By the way, just just as a, a show note for everyone, uh, we are recording this at four thirty, five o'clock on Friday. Yeah, late, late, late. late. Uh, the reason we the reason we held off was it's been a kind of a chaotic week here, but also it's just been a chaotic week everywhere. Yeah, and we wanted to um, find out what was going to happen with the government, and we just don't know. <laughs> You know, and honestly, right. there's there's so many other shows out there that are giving you best of nonsense at this time of year. And we want to make sure you've got a fresh new episode of The Professional Left. And there's a lot to talk about. But right now, literally at the moment, I'm looking here and glancing over my shoulder. No one knows the federal government is going to be open tomorrow we don't morning. Know yet. And so no. we're sorry. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, we do know that Jeff Flake is is going back and forth and saying there's no path forward for the House bill. So uh, that's. That's uh, reassuring. No, it's not. <laughs> but no. that's where, that's, yeah, we're, no. and we didn't know what to do about it because we've had kids at the doctor today. We've had kids sick today and uh, life, you know, gets in the way of thing, of doing everything we want to do. Uh, but we love you and we wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and mm-hmm. Happy Holidays and have a great week and uh, Happy Zapadan, end of Zapadan. Uh you know, mm-hmm. that's that's a that's going on this week. We're ending Zappadan. Uh, but we love you. And I wanted to talk for a minute about uh, I went to church this week. I went on Monday for half an hour. Uh, we do a sign up uh, where everyone that signs up comes in for 30 minutes and prays for the community, prays for a safe Christmas for everyone uh, and, and sort of, it gives everyone an opportunity. It's a vigil for the community. It's also a vigil for us to sort of get out of the craziness of the holidays and get away and, and sit in the front of the church. They make it real nice with rocking chairs and reading material and so forth. I sat down and uh, looked at some of the reading material they had. And one of the things was a book about, uh, Advent. And it talked about how, the the beginning of Christmas started with a mad king. And I went, aha. (laughs) Aha, aha, aha. Yes. That's podcastable. That's podcastable. I came home and said, you know, Christmas started with a mad king. Oh, that's right. It did. A mad king doing stupid shit and moving people around and immigration and refugees. And, you know, Jesus was a refugee and so forth. There, There have been a lot of connections made like that this week. Uh, and we can announce, and, and if you haven't heard yet, the Supreme Court uh, did decide today that Donald Trump doesn't keep, get to keep people applying for safe harbor in the United States. He doesn't get to keep them out just because he wants to. Right. Uh, oh, and sorry. Uh, apparently Ruth Bader Ginsburg voted from the hospital. And so we are, mm-hmm. she is, boy, she in our thoughts. Um, I also wanted to talk for a minute about... Uh, Something I learned this week about the Magnitsky Act, and if you haven't read Russian Roulette yet, which, you know, David Korn and his colleagues book, the stuff in there, uh, everything about this whole Trump-Russia thing, everything about Trump, it's all about the sanctions. Everything is about getting rid of the sanctions for money. And if you follow the money, uh, that's what Flynn was on the phone with Russia about during the inauguration. Yep. Getting rid of the sanctions and getting interest in getting a 19% interest in a Russian energy company. Uh, Or maybe it was a Turkish energy company. I can't exactly remember, but I, I was reading this week in uh, David Korn's book about, and it's not just David Korn. I'm sorry. I can't forget the, I forget the other guy's name, Uh, but Russian roulette about the Magnitsky act. And Magnitsky was a Russian whistleblower, tax attorney, and uh, it's fascinating to read how uh, this was about a hedge fund billionaire getting his money stolen by the Kremlin. Right. They they went yep. in and they accused this hedge fund of tax evasion. I've been reading more about it today. Uh, they accused this hedge fund billionaire from London who's doing business in Russia of tax evasion. Then very much like uh, Michael Cohen does, they set up some companies. They set up companies to claim that this hedge fund had defrauded them. 
Then they secret, this is amazing. You'll love this. They secretly hired attorneys that claimed to be representing the hedge fund to plead guilty in Russian court to defrauding the invented companies that the thieves made up, created to charge the hedge fund. So in other words, the thieves owned the companies that were suing. They owned Uh the attorneys for the hedge fund who were coming in to plead guilty. And so the Russian court said, okay, Kate, that case is decided. You're guilty. You're pleading guilty. The hedge fund didn't know <laughs> anything about this, but it allowed these so-called, you know, we would call them LLCs, whatever Michael Cohen set up for Trump. We set up a company to take away all of this money from this hedge fund. This hedge fund manager was then furious and went to the United States and went to Barack Obama's administration and said, You've got to do sanctions against Putin. He has stolen all of this money. Yes. And he has also killed my tax attorney, who was Magnitsky. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who is a a long-term Russian whistleblower, no friend of Putin. You know, Putin had had a tag on him for a long time and killed him. And he died in prison. And so there was a moral imperative, of course, to do something to say something about that. But it was the pushing of a multi-millionaire billionaire hedge fund manager, international money, money, money Mm -hmm. that got that done. And that to me was so disheartening that it's not about morality. It's not about, uh, you know, making sure that the rule of law is followed. It's a keeping the world safe for democracy. You mean? Yeah, yeah. It's not about keeping the world safe for democracy. It's a billionaire in DC making noise and getting right. all the meetings in order yeah. to talk about, you have to do sanctions. Well, you know, if you want a law change in this country, make sure white people suffer under it. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. I, hate to, I hate to break it to the, yeah. to the, no, the listeners, exactly but if you, right. you're exactly right. you know, you, the people in power have to sweat. If, if As soon as their shoes pinch a little bit, Things will happen. No, that's exactly uh, right. People, and we know that about we know that about the opioid crisis. As soon as yep. it's white people that are ending up in body bags, mm-hmm. something's done about it. It's but a medical problem. It's a medical crisis. Black people in Chicago at night, and nobody's going to do squat. Yep. Yeah. Well, and this is you know the, the Trump administration lifted sanctions on three Russian corporations controlled by Oleg Deripaska. Who is Oleg Deripaska? He is the guy who owns Paul Manafort. Yeah, but he is it's also no longer his companies. They're now actually owned as someone on Won't Get did all of the math and all of the details. It's a really long, po- detailed post at, of all places, Won't Get, noticing that no one ever put all this together of who actually owns these companies now. It's the Kremlin. The Kremlin yeah. owns these companies now. So it's not their Posca. It's not, he does not own them anymore. Well, when, when, <laughs> when the mob takes over your business, they took over your debt. Right. You know, so <laughs> the, the the Trump, the, the Kremlin now owns Paul Manafort. Right. And it, it seems pretty clear they're making a straight up swap. I, we, you will not, uh, you and everyone you know will not end up with polonium poisoning in exchange for which, here's what you're going to do for us. And and Donald Trump is the facilitator of this. He's he, This time he's the bag man. He's the go-between. He's the, okay, yeah, I'll lift, I'll lift sanctions and we're cool, right? We're cool on this particular, you know, the VIG. I paid the VIG for the month. Is that right? And it's it's that's the thing that's that's shocking, or that's the thing that that it's hard to get over. It's all happening in the open. Yep. There's no secrecy about who are the criminals here, what their motivations are, who the bad guys are in that universe, how they're connected to each other. It's just such a monstrously huge crime that encompasses the Trump uh, the Trump Tower in Moscow. The uh, inauguration fund, the Trump Foundation, it, it, the Trump family is a massive multi generational criminal enterprise who learned how to do one thing really well: launder money. Which it, well, launder money too. They're pretty good at that. They're really good at getting stupid people to give them money and their votes. Right, right. They're good at learning what dumb people need to hear in order to part with things that are valuable to them. And so, obviously, the Republican Party built an entire base that is 100% susceptible 
to con men telling them terrible things and having them do dumb things that are against their self-interest that are in, in the interests of the people who built the party. A better con man came along and said, well, thank you very much. You just prepared 60, 000, 60 million pigeons for me to pluck, and now I'm going to do it. I'll be louder than you. I'll be more racist than you. I'll be more open than you. I'll be more swaggeringly proud of my bigotry than you, and they will follow me. And that's and exactly what happened. They have a large amount of access to disposable income to donate to build a wall. $12 million now has been raised. That's insane. And uh, it's clear from all of the mainstream press that's writing about this that those people are going to have to have their money returned to them. There is no uh, mechanism by which any group of Americans can simply raise a billion dollars and then tell the government what to do with it. If that was mm -hmm. the case, we could be raising money for go the government to uh, perform abortions or give it to Planned sure. Parenthood or make universal health care or free college or what just let's just do a GoFundMe for whatever liberals want. Raise the universal money. Universal voter ID. Universal you know? voter ID. Universal sure. voting rights and paper ballots everywhere. We raise the money. You got to do it. Uh, that's not how the, that's not how the government works. And so. Uh, it's not going to happen. But uh, the interesting part to me of all of this is this guy who started this GoFundMe uh, has been publishing uh, conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton and doing all kinds of weird shit about uh, with blogs and vets and stuff. And he is a real person. He is a triple amputee. He is a veteran. Uh, his GoFundMe makes that clear that that those are the bona fides. I am a real person. I have a blue check mark. You can trust me because I'm not some fly by night operator. I have all of this web presence that is verified. I went on Laura Ingram's show and showed my face and showed who I am and showed what I'm going to do. So you can trust me that I'm going to do this. Well, go fund me. And I'm, I'm telling you this because thank you very much to our listeners. I have raised more than 50%, we have raised more than 50% of the $4,700 I'm trying to raise to pay off my medical mm -hmm. bills. And we're going to end that fundraiser on January 31st at midnight. That's It's got to end there for tax purposes. It's got to end there. GoFundMe requires you and I, Drift Glass, yep. to say where the money's going, yep. to provide bank account verification, to provide... Our, our identification that, so that they know who we are, et cetera. And GoFundMe, unlike PayPal, does not hold on to the money. It appears in my bank account the next day. So this $12 million is in somebody's bank account right now. Mm -hmm. I don't, and he doesn't say anywhere on the GoFundMe page. He does a lot about blue check mark and here's who I am and I've been on Laura and I've done this and you know, you know me and you know that I will do what I say. He doesn't say anything about the money. You know, the money will be deposited in a secure account. All interest will be accrued to the fund. He doesn't say any of that. We don't know what's happening to the interest on that money. That's a lot. That $12 million is a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And he's raised it and it is being transferred out of GoFundMe to someone as we speak, as it comes in. They daily take it out they don't live on the float they take a fee off and they send it to the person mm -hmm. that's supposed to, the recipient that money's going somewhere and part of the terms of service of gofundme is you have to spend it on what you say you're going to spend it on so otherwise it's fraud i mean yeah. there's no there's no way to not do it you have to pay off your debts if you'd say you're going to do that so uh and again thank you it it makes me mad and i'm not i'm not complaining about anyone who's hearing my voice right now i find it a miracle that anyone would give me five dollars i really do yeah. you, you don't know me i'm not your friend i'm i you know my voice and you've heard me over some 472 podcasts but you know the fact that people open their wallets to us is just to me, a miracle. It's astonishing. I mean, thank you so much. Yeah, it is. It's, it really is. You know, you and I both. Uh, you you work for Crooks and Liars, and I I sit in a tree and think deep thoughts and write. You know, <laughs> I write one post while my wife does ten. Um, <laughs> That's true. Today uh, that was true. <laughs> but you know, it, it's always a miracle to me that you and I start the day essentially with a blank sheet of paper. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. by the end of the day, we've created something, whether it's good or bad. And an astonishingly large number of people like it and appreciate it and approve of it yeah. and give us feedback about it. And that, as a writer, that's always astonishing to me. It's always it amazing is, to me that happens. Techno- it's the nexus of technology and when we were born mm-hmm. and how much time we've been practicing at it and so forth. And, and the fact that people appreciate us and we've developed friendships over this. I mean, there are people that I write back to on a regular basis and, and really like as people. Uh, but what, what makes me mad is then looking at this con job wall situation and the publicity that it's getting in the right and seeing someone has dropped $50,000 on that pay on that GoFundMe. Yeah. Some company has dropped $12,000 some uh, basement waterproofing company in Michigan has dropped $12,000 on the wall. If they had to spare. Yeah. They had laying around loose. Yep. And we're, we're to, and here we are scraping with, you know, and as I say, when I, (laughs) when we say, see 50 to a hundred dollars come in to GoFundMe or PayPal or whatever it is, that is a moment when one of us will get out of our chair and go and tell the other one. That's how big a deal it is. It's a, so we have a bell. I'm, I'm, I ring the bell. It's real loud. <laughs> Everyone on the block knows, oh, they got a $20 contribution. That's amazing. As I have done on fundraisers at Crooks and Liars, and I think uh, the the staff at Crooks and Liars is coming around to my way of thinking that getting those $5 contributions, yeah. they really add up and they allow more people to participate. And you know, if, when you've, if you've talked to anyone that's done nonprofit fundraising, they would rather have 10 five dollar contributions than 150 because yeah. the more participation you get the better it is for the long range ability of your organization to keep going yeah um every church knows people, that people's incomes go up and down and people's circumstances go up and down and if you have five people that are able to open their wallets a little bit uh you know if if one of them gets cancer or one of them loses their a job or whatever you've still got a consistent stream of income for your cause to keep going. And here I'm talking too long about this, but but it did just it just irks me that here is all of this disposable income going to uh, um a cause that is based on bigotry and hate. It's it's a con job. And and the and whole it's, and it's a con. The whole <laughs> Republican party is one giant fucking criminal scam. And people keep who are clearly undertaxed, yes. <laughs> keep flushing their their quote unquote disposable income by the billions down this rat hole of a party that all, exists only to fuck them over, and they won't wake up from it because they can't. Because again, if you look in that mirror for more than a second and see what you've turned into, what you've enabled, you know what your votes and your enthusiasm and your money has has been turned into weapons to destroy your own country. You know how do you live with that? Well, Um, and I did have an exchange with someone this week who said, you know, as of September, I really thought Donald Trump was going to live up to his promises. And now I see that he's not. And I replied to him and I was trying to be uh, supportive of where he was in time and say. You're trying to be a better person than I will ever be. Go ahead and say it. Go ahead. I said, Donald Trump and his party conned you. And at least you're not continuing to dig. You know, pat yourself on the back because. The, the number one thing you can do at this point is stop digging. And he said, well, my party hasn't let me down. If it wasn't for the Republicans, we'd be a socialist hellhole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Click, click no, by. <laughs> Mute, yeah. right? Mute. Oh, as yeah. speaking of Christmas seasonal miracles, a very oh. small one. But um, so as I mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Hugh Hewitt. You might know him as the uh, cyborg sent from the future to destroy America. That's what I've heard. Uh, it, it's one of my lonely battles out there in the world. It's David Brooks and Andrew Sullivan and, and Hugh Hewitt is a cause of mine because he's just so horribly unfit um, from a biological point of view well, to you look and I at. both have, have exchanged comments about Hugh Hewitt that if we had known Hugh Hewitt at the age of 17, we might have saved him. Right. It might have been possible, but he is he is. I also refer to them as is the mayor of Uncanny Valley. Uh, the Uncanny Valley is that weird thing that happens in animation where it's not quite human and it make, it, it creeps you out because your, your brain recognizes this is not a human being. This is some sort of some sort of thing that ain't ain't what it's pretending to be. Um, Hugh Hewitt, as I mentioned a few moments ago, was on the television. Hugh Hewitt is now being dragged across social media. He is actually trending right now, uh, including your your boss, John Amato, uh, 
saying, why the, f-? this isn't John Amato, but this is everyone on Twitter saying, why the fuck is Hugh Hewitt on television? Mm-hmm. Why is this sat- lying sack of shit? I will never watch this show. He's a fake human being. Fire him. Fire. And this is just comment after comment after comment because we're right and they're wrong. And it's so obvious that if you're going to Hugh Hewitt as the intellectual vanguard of the other side, because you really feel that both sides have to be represented at the table, maybe it's time to get a different table. Mm -hmm. Because people like that do not belong in the public square. They do not belong as a part of a civilized conversation about how to run this country among adults of good faith. Because he's none of those things. None of these people are. And the fact you keep shoving him in our face tells me all I need to know about how much I can trust Chuck Todd or really a whole lot of people at MSNBC because that's the thing that drives me nuts. They all know that, oh, uh, Bill Crystal is a lying, bloodthirsty fraud and none of them will say it. They all know that John Podhoritz is a lying, bloodthirsty fraud and none of them will say it. It's the degree to which they're gelded that they won't turn the lens on their own organization and see that the, the, the infection they're fighting outside the walls is inside the walls. They know it. They goddamn well know it. They're smart people, but they won't say it. And that undercuts their credibility across the board. Yep. yep. Now, do you want me to talk about David Brooks or no? Uh, you have, uh, how much time do you have to talk about David Brooks? You have yeah. three minutes and 35 seconds to talk about David Brooks. Go. Ready, set, go. Uh, okay. So earlier this week, I wrote a post about um, the Niskanen Center, which, according to Jonathan Chait, is a libertarian-leaning Washington think tank, which held a conference on the future of the Republican Party called Starting Over, the center right after Trump. Okay. So I'm, I'm already throwing up in my, in my lap. Yes. And they have a whole bunch of good ideas, all of which are straight out of the Democratic Party platform. I was going to say, when I read about them, I thought... They're really Hillary Clinton Democrats, aren't they? Yeah, they really are. Hillary Clinton, as First Lady Hillary Clinton Democrats, they are First Lady Hillary Clinton Democrats posing as libertarian quasi-Republicans. Yeah. Now, and so I wrote about them on Tuesday because this was such clickbait for David Brooks. I knew eventually he'd come around to sniff it. (laughs) And and of course he did. His whole column uh, today was exactly this. So the problem with these people is, A, that they have any money at all going, they have like $3 million a year budget to to dust off ideas, as I think um, uh, Boswood said today, uh, felt one of my fellow David Brooks ologists out there, um, that this is these ideas are from the Democratic Party before Ronald Reagan. <laughs> you know, there's nothing new about this. And the people who've been trying to tear down these ideas for the last 30 years have been people like David Brooks. So um, I wrote about it on Tuesday. The big problem with their plan is the problem with all their plans. All of these people, all the third way people and and the the no labels people, all of them have the same problem, which is your party cultivated a zombie army of 60 million meatheads that are out there right now. Where do you think they're going to go? Do you just you can't just wish them away. You just can't pretend they don't exist. Boy, how do they exist? And they run the Republican Party, which is why we're in such fucking trouble. So what's your plan for getting rid of them? What's your plan for for excising them from the politic uh, uh, politics of our country? How do you hold them out of elections? Where are you going to shunt them that they won't do any harm? This is this is coal dust. This is slag. This is the waste product from your 30 year political project. What do you plan to do about them? As far as I can tell, their plan is they're going to sit in their walled garden, jerking off to porn about centrism until liberals do all the hard work and heavy lifting of actually transforming the country and actually marginalizing the lunatics that they spent 30 years building. And then they're going to come out of the stasis field and say, thank you very much for cleaning up our country. We'll take over now. Fuck that. So that was my, that was, that was my opinion of, Jonathan Chait and the Niskanen Center on Tuesday. I think so, Professor. While you're while we are working and cleaning that up, every opportunity they have to block that will ha- will. Oh God, yes. Oh no, absolutely. This is the the history of, and this is this is what I wrote about today, <laughs> because the uh, the David Brooks column today is a new center being born. Oh, the centrists have returned, Blue Gal, and they're here. And it's the same fucking group that Jonathan Chait wrote about on Tuesday. 
and that I wrote about on Tuesday. It's the same problem. It's David Brooks's favorite word is the center, except it's a mathematical function. It's wherever Donald Trump is today and whatever some liberal is that he's terrified of today, add them up, divide by two, that's the center. And he, he won't stop doing this. And he has the same problem. What are you going to do about the entire Republican Party that exists as it is now that hates this idea that will destroy anyone who opposes this idea? And the idea for David Brooks is, again, he's going to wait it out in his pool house for 30 years or 20 years until we do all the work. And he's going to pop out and say, thank you very much. I will be running the country now. And the the problem that he has is that occasionally he's such – he writes about this so frequently. And I, I, I cite three or four or five examples of exactly this headline, a second GOP, a conservative future, party number three, how to reinvent the GOP over the course of like 15 years. The history catches up with him. So as Jonathan Chait, to his credit, noted back in 2013 – David Brooks was freaking out about Barack Obama not being centristy enough and pointed out that all of the shit David Brooks was freaking out over, Barack Obama had already done or was doing. And it was this moment where, wait a minute, you said to qualify as a delightful, uh, intellectual, uh, uh, compassionate centrist, you know, your guy. Barack Obama would have to do A, B, C, and D. He just did A, B, C, and D. How can he still be an extreme leftist in your view? And that's because David Brooks needs him to be an extreme leftist. He, he, he and Michael Gerson both literally wrote that basically Barack Obama was being so liberal, or I'm sorry, not so liberal, so reasonable, that he was exposing the Republican Party as a bunch of racist lunatics. And this is what was so unfair. And, and that's why... He, I, I don't understand why David Brooks has a job. Exactly. That's the bottom line. Yeah. But he has this he he has the same he has struck the same corrupt bargain with the same moguls and and corporate entities and media owners that Hugh Hewitt has struck and John Podhoritz has struck and Bill Crystal has struck and Chuck Todd has struck and Joe and Joe uh, Joe Scarborough has struck and on down the list. And Michael Gerson has struck. They've all created this universe where they they will never be held accountable. And during this war and we are at war with the right right now where it's a cold war, but we're fighting them tooth and nail. They will do nothing to help us. They will do at, except to stand on the sidelines and bitch about how uncivil we are and how often we use the word fuck. And isn't it a shame how we're not humble in the way that we're defending the country? They'll wait it out on the sidelines. And if we get too far out ahead of things, they will rush right in just like they did during the Obama administration to sabotage us. And that's why they cannot be trusted because the minute, the minute we're ahead, the minute we make any headway, Rick Wilson and Charlie Sykes and David Brooks Will, will stab us in the back. You cannot trust these people because they have proven you can't trust them. They, they've shown us their hearts. They're corrupt. They're mercenary. At this point, David Brooks can't possibly be this stupid. He has to know he's lying. And everyone who's a peer of his has to know he's lying. Everyone who pays him has to know he's lying. So the question then has to become, why do they keep investing in this liar? Why do they keep paying this notoriously idiotic, myopic liar to keep telling the same stupid lies to the same stupid people forever? And the answer is exactly for exactly the same reason they keep paying Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, not because he tells them the truth. He tells them the fairy tales they wish to believe. And until we wake them the fuck up, until we sequester those people, until those people are silenced, we're never going to get out of this trap. Because no matter how bad things get, there will always be someone like David Brooks to straddle the fence and say, yeah, but Bernie Sanders. And that's what he did today. Today, just like every other day, buried in his column is the razor blade of on the, the Trumpists on the one side and the Bernie Sanders left on the other. And that's how he makes his fucking living. And I don't know how he can live with himself other than the fact, you know, <laughs> he's doing very he's doing great. So uh, far be it for me to criticize his financial choices, but his moral choices are obscene. Anyway, I think that's my three minutes. <laughs> that's <laughs> nice, honey. All right. I yeah. love doing this with you, you know. You too, yeah. darling. And and everybody, we we send our love to you, all of you out there in uh, podcast land. Drift Class, let's do the news roundup. Donald Trump 
at this moment is still trying to shift blame for the potential government shutdown to Democrats, even though he very explicitly said last week he would proudly take credit for the shutdown. Yep, that was this week, actually. Yes, he did. Yep. yep. Oh, I'm sorry. This uh, week. Mm-hmm. Adderall Stevenson on Twitter is now just one long unhinged Trump shutdown. Hashtag Trump <laughs> shutdown. And uh, right now, um, Doug Jones has voted with the Republicans, mm-hmm. Alabama Senator Doug Jones, mm-hmm. to bring the House bill onto the floor. It was 47-47 with Mike Pence breaking the tie just to bring it to the floor for a vote. It still needs 60 votes in the Senate to pass, Mm -hmm. which it does not have. Bringing it to the floor was Mm 47-47. So uh, 47 people voted no (laughs) to bringing it to the floor. It doesn't have 60 votes. So that's where we're at at the moment. And uh, it is hashtag Trump shutdown. Uh, Donald Trump compared construction of the border wall to the, quote, the wheel and claimed to understand technology better than anyone. Uh, And we all know now what happens when a judge surprises the prosecution by saying Flynn (laughs) is more guilty than even they think he is. Yeah. And do we have a word on treason or not? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, judge, I haven't I don't have the paperwork on that in front of me. But and then he comes back from recess. You know, I didn't really mean the whole treason thing, but. It's a good question, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's treason-ish. It's treason adjacent, let's just say. You want to take a few weeks to think about what you're doing there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll take it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump's 2016 campaign and his re-election campaign used a shell company to buy ads in allegedly illegal coordination with the National Rifle Association, also known as Maria Butina's home base in America. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she's still in jail, from what I hear. Uh, yeah. So far, everyone Trump has tried to assert into the attorney general's chain of command has one thing in common. They think the attorney general should not be investigating Trump. Yeah. And uh, his latest acting attorney general got some word from uh, the ethics department of the White House and said, yeah, never mind. I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to uh, recuse myself because I know what happens when to uh, AGs that do that, right? Yeah, yeah, they end up being tweeted into oblivion. Right. Uh, today, or this week, Donald Trump signed the $867 billion farm welfare bill, because that's exactly what it is. It's welfare, to, to uh, prop up U.S. farmers that have been screwed over by his trade war with China. Putin patted Donald Trump on the head for handing over Syria to Russia, calling it, quote unquote, correct. Hey, this is the week that we found out that nu- uh, North Korea will not give up its nuclear weapons program until it gets security assurances from the United States, like the United States being denuclearized. So everything Donald Trump said about the nuclear agreement, the summit with North Korea, womp womp, turned out to be a big fat fucking lie. Mick Mulvaney is taking all the jobs. As a child, young Mickey Mulvaney dreamed one day I'll grow up and become Donald Trump's bidet. Yeah. That was his childhood dream. <laughs> But he is, and apparently he's very happy doing that. So newly obtained document shows Donald Trump signed a letter of intent to build the Trump Tower in Moscow. Uh, CNA located the document within days of Rudy Giuliani swearing that no such document exists. Rather than bursting into flames and disappearing from the face of the earth, Giuliani just reversed himself and said, well, of course Donald Trump signed the, quote, bullshit letter of intent to build the tower in Russia. Yeah, and Fox, because, Fox News had to do quite a bit of a flip-flop on that and start talking about gender-neutral gingerbread men. You know, gingerbreads have penises. It's, it's true. <laughs> Everyone knows that. It's, it's got penis. Santa Claus is white and gingerbread uh, creatures have penises. Yes, they do. Michael yes. Cohen dropped the two libel suits against BuzzFeed and Fusion GPS over the publication of the Steele dossier yeah. because he's got to go to jail in March. He's very Can busy. Can we call it square, guys? Can we just, are we cool now? Are we, yeah, we're cool. We're cool. Don't worry about it. Uh, a federal judge dismissed the Trump administration policy that turned away asylum seekers who claimed uh, to be suffering from domestic violence or gang violence. Judge Emmett Sullivan of the U.S. District Court in Washington ruled that the policies ordered by Jeff Sessions were, quote, arbitrary, capricious, and in violation of the immigration laws. Of the United States of America. Yep. Uh And finally, Trump will close his foundation and give away its remaining $1.7 million in assets amid a lawsuit accusing the Trump, Ivanka, Eric, and Trump Jr. of illegally using the foundation for personal and political gain. 
New York Attorney General Barbara Underwood accused the foundation of a, quote, shocking pattern of illegality, which included, quote, unlawful coordination with the Trump presidential campaign, shock, that was, quote, willful and repeated, unquote. Trump used the charity's money to pay legal settlements for his private business, to purchase a $10,000 portrait of Trump that was displayed at one of his golf clubs, and to make a prohibited political donation. The Attorney General's office is seeking for the Trump Foundation to pay $2.8 million in restitution, and all of the assets will be distributed to charities approved by the Attorney General's office. Yeah, that's going to really kill them. Yeah. Yeah, and also the, idea that, that he, the Attorney General of New York also wants to prevent the Trump children from ever sitting on a charitable board in New York ever again. So there go uh, Ivanka's parties. Yeah, she can't be on that red carpet anymore. Yeah. They're done in New York. They're, They're in torched in New York. Yep. Uh huh. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Nellie. This is a gorgeous photograph of a cat. Nellie. In, in her picture, Nellie is sitting in a tree, and she does not want to talk about it. <laughs> but she's perfectly framed by the branches, and you should go and look at Nellie at our Facebook page and website. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you at Christmas or any time. We got some gorgeous Christmas cards in the mail. Uh, thank you for those. And uh, we love hearing from you at the holiday season and anytime. Feel free to write us. Uh, and the mail is being delivered. I have received yarn in the mail. I have received you have. honey in the mail. And uh, you have received some scotch, but I think that was from your brother. It was. This good time. choice, by the this way, bro. Time. Good. Very good choice. This time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, I have received other gifts in the mail, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. So thank you. Uh, the Postal Service does a great job. We love our postal unions, and uh, we can receive anything at the PO box. You know, if you want to send something in a box, that's uh, you can do that. Yeah, I, I am. I'm always impressed by the Postal Service of the United States, but yeah. this time of year, they just go the literally the extra mile. Oh, and, and they are open, by the way, on Sunday this week. Yep. We're open yes, last they are. Sunday. Your mm-hmm. post office is open on Sunday this week if you need that. Yeah. All right. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, or let's face it, if you bought one of those uh, Instant Pots this year, yeah. <laughs> if you can afford an Instant Pot, you need to buy something for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And we're talking to you, George Soros, just <laughs> so we're clear. <laughs> We didn't even talk about George Soros. No, we didn't. I haven't gotten a check from George Soros, but, you know, I really want George Soros to give his money to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. I do, too. I want him to send George me a $5 Soros, check. That's all. George, I just want to f- so you can frame it, right? Exactly. I don't want to spend it. Are you kidding me? I want to walk into every conservative headquarters. I want to walk into every conservative Republican meeting and say, here's my fucking Choro sec, motherfucker. Here it is. Five right here. Soros. Dollars. $5. Yeah. George Soros sent me $5. Yeah. So suck it. No, but he, but really, he is doing such wonderful work uh, for the UN High Commission on Refugees. And uh, the reason I know that is I give, I have given $5 to the UN High Commission on Refugees because I it, when I see refugee children suffering, I just can't not do something. And a $5 check is something I can do. You should know that, that Blue Gal just gives your money away. Uh, <laughs> I, I did, every once in a while, I take $5 well, out of my children's mouth and yes. give it to to immigrant children and refugee children. I slapped the last tater tot out of, out of Junior Dude's mouth and gave it to some <laughs> poor people. Also, we are literally card-carrying members of the ACLU. And this, you know. Yes, this, we are. So, uh, but, but I... There are, those are the three charities. One is yeah. ACLU, the other is UNHCR, and the third one is Habitat for Humanity, which we well, support locally. Uh, and our local, well, there's a lot of local charities we support. Yeah, too. local yeah. charities. But as George Soros was made uh, Financial Times Person of the Year this year for all the things he does and for all the things he's accused of doing that he doesn't do. So, uh, that was a smack in the face to right-wing media, if ever there was one, and we're grateful for that. We're grateful for all you do, George Soros. Approximately 1% of our listeners, one half of 1% of our listeners support yeah. this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. 
See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. That's where our P.O. box is. That's where our PayPal button is. That's where our GoFundMe button is. That's where our Buy Us a Coffee button is. And that's where our merch is. Uh, and if so, if you want a Both Sides Don't bumper sticker or you want a DGBG, uh, kind of, it's kind of a CGBG. Is that the way, the band? What is it? The the nightclub? It was the club. CD, yeah. CGBG? CBGB. But, yeah, mm-hmm. but it's, it's DGBG, DGBG instead mm-hmm. on the t-shirt. Uh, all that stuff is there. And you, all you have to do is go to proleftpod.com and you can access all of it. Tammy, we love you. Uh, she's our uh, angel nerd and web guru, and she just did a great job on our website. We're so grateful for, to her for all her help. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. That's an impossible sentence, Blue Gal. Come on. <laughs> Give yourself a break. That's a goddamn impossible sentence. I don't know who, what clown writes these scripts, but I'm having words with them <laughs> after this goddamn show. Sorry, I, I get emotional sometimes about the staff around here. Share our show on social media. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know how that make that past the third tier of editors we have for everything we do. We don't have a third tier of editors. No. There's only you no. and me, baby. Just you and me, baby. Thank you, everyone, for sharing the show. It always tickles me to see you do that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties want to say Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays and Happy Hanukkah and Happy Kwanzaa and Happy Mithrasmas and have a wonderful solstice, one and all. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the wine and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.